Shalom, shalom. I think we're on. I think we're on live. I just hope I'm doing everything right. Here we go. All right. Shalom. Thursday Night Live. We are live again after a week off for Thanksgiving. It was such a time of deep gratitude and such a time of families and such a time of everything that Genesis is about because the book of Bereshit is ostensibly a book about the first dysfunctional Jewish family ever. And Thanksgiving is a wonderful way to allow us to test all of the, the life skills we think we're forming through this Genesis journey. And then in the midst of it, we have our family formations and it's all kind of like kaput. Or we elevate, right? And we, and we allow ourselves and our greatest selves to come forward. So it's a time to think about what that was. But this is Thursday Night Live and we are going live. We are a show of looking at Torah in its uh, shot as well in a postmodern vein that we're looking at how Torah flows through us. We're not looking to flow through Torah. We take a few psukim and we go deep with them. So if we're ready, I just want to um, first begin with this blessing of Torah. So just to kind of bring it in, connect the blessing to the breath. The breath is so powerful. The breath has the ability to, to remediate and regulate the heartbeat and the pulse and the way our blood flows through us. It is a cellular relationship, the breath. And so let us take this breath. It's great to breathe with people online. Isn't that what all of this technology was created for? I think at the very least, it can help us to connect when we're alone. And with that, I take in one more breath. And offer Baruch Atah Adonai Elohimu Melech Haolam Asher Kitshanu B'Mitzvah Tov V'Tzivanu La'asok B'Divrei Torah. These words of Torah that I have this this primitive, primordial urge to know, that is what a mitzvah is to me. I'm going to really engage and get the business of my kavanot, my intention into my Torah. And so here we go. We go into Thursday Night Live with a few ground rules. Uh, we establish a covenant and kavanot. And number one, I love to say the shior comes from a really personal place of love. There are going to be lots of haters out there, and I want to say that's all kind of like a reflection of what we have in ourselves, because I love your Torah, and I learned from your Torah, and this is just my Torah, and I was given a platform to share it. And the only reason why I think it's important to share it is because I think each and every one of us are meant to share our Torah. That is what I think in the rabbinic imagination will bring redemption. So this is just my Torah. Uh, number two, we must open our hearts to transformation, because isn't that the reason why we engage in Torah? Like if I'm not in it to change myself, then why bother? Uh, number three, I recommend getting a journal and uh, a legal pad, something to write on in whatever format writing works for you. And the reason of that is because journaling brings out a part of us that doesn't exist without it. Um, number four, when judgments arrive, arise and arrive, uh, to let them kind of pass like little thought bubbles and not get too um, connected with them. Um, number five, there are many ways to do Jewish, right? This is just my personal way. This is one path I'm offering tonight. And number six along those lines is the idea that um, Jewish denominationalism is a 19th century Jewish innovation. And so you could be conservative, conservadox, orthodox, non-denominational, trans-denominational, reconstructionist, renewal, whatever it is, these are all beautiful and ripe ways of being Jewish or Jewish. And let's just all be Jewish together. Great. Uh, let's move into this Torah and think where we are in this calendar year and in this Torah cycle. Um, in the calendar year, it's a really fascinating time because we've gone through the time of Genesis or kind of ends or right in the middle of the month of Kislev. Month is powerful. It's the month of darkness. It's 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 like when we had the the shortest shortest days of the year, and we're asked as people of a Jewish memory 
to have this holiday of light. Thousands of you who might be going there next week, let's see. Um, but this festival of lights really is a theological statement of how we are to deal with darkness. And so we're given this festival of lights. And as we're ascending through Kislev, we, we need to allow our light to grow. And so what Torah does is it companions us with the stories of our ancestors. Um, so we have to rededicate our lives because Hanukkah means dedication. So rededicate our lives. And while we're dwelling in the darkness, a time of great dreams, of great slumbers, of, of human stillness, to go deep into the breath and to allow ourselves to rededicate our light or even find it in this darkness. We're dancing with the shadow. We're dancing in the dark. All right. So with that, uh, where are we in the Torah cycle? We are in an ancestral story. Um, we're going to say it picked up with Lech Lecha when we met our hero, Avraham Avinu. And from this kind of progenitor, this patriarch, we went through the Isaac story and now we're in the Jacob story. So we're in the grandson story of the progenitor. And a part of what I like to liken it with is, is asking like, who is Abraham? You know, Abraham is the one who left his land. He reminds me of my great grandfather who left Russia and came to America. He would never go back to his land and he came to a land that he was shown. And then who is Isaac? Isaac is the, the, um, the son of, of that dreamer who, whose life was sacrificed. You know, it's like my grandfather who lived during the depression, right? And the grandfather who lived during the depression, who, whose life and sight was kind of shortened by the choices of the father, the grandfather, the progenitor. And then it goes from Isaac, who kind of had a, 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 a kind of weakened or compromised sense in the sacrifice for his father's dream and the fulfillment of his father's dream. Who did the grandfather have, which was that greatest generation and the sacrifices they had in America in World War II? Who are the children of, of that generation but the baby boomers, right? And that's where you get kind of a Jacob. You get a dreamer. You get this incredible dreamer seeing the world in a transformative way. He's, he's an idealist. He's, he's, he's someone who is a, he's a, an iconoclast. Um, he has free love, right? He has four wives. He goes into life really big. And, and who, who is his child? But Joseph, right, the non-gender conforming, non-binary, you know, makeup wearing man, but I get ahead of myself, but he's kind of like the millennial, right? We're not going to go there yet, but this is kind of an idea I'm working on is, is these, these four generations. And I, I'm curious as whether it's a cycle, whether it's a cycle that happens through millennia that we, we kind of cycle through these personalities and Abraham is just our... Um, our progenitor of this cycle beginning. And so I, I think of Abraham and I think of, uh, of how he brought us to Jacob and that's where we are today. And so we go into Parshat uh, Vayetze tonight and Parshat Vayetze is, is just so rich in its um, imagery. We don't really need to go that many pasukim into it because the imagery is just so rich. And then as we enter into it, we also want to think, um, what is driving these protagonists on their journey? And that's where we get into the God concept of what kind of brings us into, into this journey. So um, with that, let's go into, into a little Torah and let's look at, um, at, this, at this moment. So we move on. Okay, so we begin. If you have a, if you have a Chumash, if you have a Tanakh, if you have uh, Sfaria online, I say go into it. And we're going to take a look at the first Pesuk. And tonight it's so rich that I just want us to dwell in the language of this Torah portion. Because the first word itself is like, oh my goodness, it's a gavolt. It's a total gavolt. Because this whole thing began with Lech Lecha. You know, with, with Avraham Avinu. When he was Avraham, he was a little sprout. And he goes and, and this God concept says Lech Lecha. And, and so that energy that begins that parrots, that explosion of energy that begins, right? It continues. And here 
we have the story of Jacob who until Dote had fled from his shadow brother and he, he moves towards this new space. And when we meet him as he's, he's kind of fled from his home, the first word we're, we're met with is Vayetze. Vayetze. It's the same language that will be then used for the creation of the people of Israel, Yitziat Mitzrayim, the foundational concept of Jewish peoplehood, right? And it begins now, who creates these tribes that are to go out one day? But Yaakov, and Yaakov, when he first goes on his individuated journey, by Yetze Yaakov, Jacob goes out. He goes out, Meber Sheva, from the, the dwelling place of the of, of the seven wells where we're told Abraham was reunited with Keturah, who we're told was Hagar, right? So he, he actually, when he fled, he went to this place of, um, of his ancestral homeland. Maybe it was uh, Abraham's happy place. And then it's, right? And then, like Lech Lecha, there's a parallelism, that he goes towards Haran, again, the land of, of Abraham. So he's, he's on that kind of emerging adulthood identity journey. And to begin it, we have to go within. We have to know, like, who am I and who created the cells of, these, of this body? Like, Jacob is starting this whole journey really trying to understand who he is. And I think that this is where Torah is nudging us and saying like, who are you? Who are you? Know who you are. If you're gonna go out on the journey, begin not by climbing great mountains perhaps, or you know, being like fashion fabulous or like an influencer on social media. No, go, go to you, go out, go to you, the ancestral, ancestral birthplace. So he goes out, he's on this journey, and then it's this like wild moment because when we really do that in our lives, I don't know if you've had this experience, I've had this experience. When we really invite it, when we really kind of give all the ego up and say, I'm just going to accept that this life is about me understanding my place in it and the vital, the vital contribution that only I can make, which might not be as important at Martha Luther King Jr. in the eyes of humanity. And yet it is as important as anyone else's contribution because without which the world cannot continue. That is true to Kun Olam, is knowing humbly what our essential offering is. That is understanding the Ikar, is knowing who I am. So what does he do when he has that reckoning of self? It says, the yifka b'makom. Now, the way it's translated is, he came upon a certain place, but I can't buy that. Because the yifka, like paga, this is a, this is like the same bilateral root as like a noga, like a, a supernova, like a super psh, bursting star in Hebrew, or maga, magafa has as similar similar root bilateral root as well, which is um, it's a it's a flip of the word, but it's it's the it's the um the word for the plagues. It's this big word paga, right? Go, and it's encounter is what it means. An encounter is like a huge, like I could spend an hour talking about what an encounter is, but this is not an ordinary word in Torah. You know, it's used in Amos, it's used with King David. It's a prophetic word of experience. It's vayifga, like he encounters makom. He encounters makom, ba makom, through this place. And that really makes me wonder, like, what does it take for us to experience an encounterment in a space? Like, how do we become antenna or receptacles for the presence of what I will transform the world, Bamakom, into Hamakom, the presence of the one, the expanded presence of the numinous truth, the transcendent, unknowable yet presence in our midst that is what that is what he was encountering i'm sorry but you've got that is what he was encountering 
he was encountering God. So this is a young man who was aligned and receptive. And my blessing and my question is how can we become more aligned and receptive in our lives, especially in a world where we're like this all day, right? On social media, is that being alive and receptive to an encounter of Hamakom if I'm like this all day? I don't think so. And so he comes upon this place or he has this encountering of something that is godly. And then it says, Sham, right? And he like kind of decided he was gonna dwell for the night. He was gonna he was gonna kind of take himself down and and allow himself to work into perhaps a slumber. So when we enter into the darkness and when we sense we might be in a place of having a presence, you ever aren't able to sleep at night? That might just be the nudging of the presence, the potential of encountering Hamakom. And if we can just get to that darkness, the awakened place of the darkness, then maybe we can create a space for the encountering experience. So he goes and he, he reclines there for the night. And then it says, Ki Shemesh, because the sun had gone down. And then it says, Ve'yikach ve'avne hamakom. And he takes from the, the rocks or stones of the place. And I love, I love the word evan. It's such a rich word, like evan, you know? The word for rock. This word for rock, when we travel, I remember when I, was, I lived in Mongolia for a spell. And we would go high on top, so you'd find as well there are rock formations at the highest point of the mountaintops. And some of them were quite large and they're actually like ancestral spaces. They're called um, Kerns, C-A-I-R-N in English. In Mongolian, they called them Awas, Awas, like, yeah, like a name for God. And then I asked them, you know, what is the name for your ancestors? And they said, well, the name for father is Av. And then they said the name for a tent was Gare. And I just started going, okay, well, Genghis Khan, you know, he was a Kohen. But I, I named this because it was when I was first in Mongolia that I had this connection to what Jacob was going through at that moment. You know, in the moment where he is in this place, he takes the rock, right? He places the stone and and he, he allows himself to, to take the stones in some sort of formation like a kern. And a kern is really an ancestral formation of rocks. And some of them are said to be places where they would go and talk to the ancestors on mountaintops, but they were holy places of encountering something greater than themselves. And again, they're universal in religions. I mean, this is like a universal religious, whether you're Native American, whether you're a Mesoamerican, whether you are Mongolian, these kerns are, are omnipresent as ritual spaces. And here we have Yaakov creating this, this presence of this rock. We're always told, oh, he just slipped it under his head as a pillow. I don't think that's what's going on. I think what's going on is he, is he was really wanting to have an intimate relationship with his ancestors. And even the rock itself, Evan, like think about the word. It's it's from the same bilateral root as of. Or if you add kind of the non at the end, which is an, um, an ending that in Aramaic is 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 the same ending as a mem, like you, they're interchangeable in different dialects of Aramaic. And so you have this like presence of this ancestry that he he kind of he kind of places it under his head. Like he wanted the wisdom of that earth where his ancestors were buried, like Hebron. Hebron is the image of earth, right? He takes the earth and he places it under his head. It's almost as if he came upon a giant kern of ancestral rocks. Maybe he was in Haran, in his ancestral birthplace. Maybe it was Terah's burial place he came to. And he wanted to curl up to his ancestors so he could know himself. And so there he goes and he lies and places his head. And we're told 
that um, we're told by the Yishkav, the Makom Hakul, that he then, he, he laid down, right? He rested in this place. And Vayashev is, is also an interesting, oh, it's by Yishkav that he was, he was laying down. And Vayishkav also is euphemistically used for um, consorting or the boom chicka boom. So I don't think he's quite doing that, but maybe it's used instead of Vayeshev, maybe it's used Vayishkav, maybe it, that word is used purposefully to suggest a fecundity or a potential birth happening in this lying down. There's lying down Vayelen, there's lying down Vayeshev, and then, then there's Vayishkav, which, which again, euphemistically could mean lovemaking. And I don't think Yaakov was there with anyone yet, or maybe there's, you know, a midrash yet to be written about some, you know, maybe Lilith visited him. I don't know. But I think there's something very rich and purposeful in that word being used here. And then what happens next is what happens when we really are placed in incredible alignment with self. When our bodies and our ancestral presence and our openness to receive are aligned, we can, I believe, access what lies beyond, what visits us in the dream state. There's a trend I've spoken of it before of a lot of young people, and not even young people, just people right now um, experimenting with psychedelics, um, psilocybin, um, mushrooms. I am not one of those people because I believe Torah invites us into that place. It invites us into a space of, of, of the liminal, that, that, that tiny membrane separating ourselves and the eternal. Torah is begging us to enter it. And no Torah is, is as writ for presence as Vayetze. And it's this verse 12. It says, Vayachalon. And he dreamt. Now that in and of itself is rich and interpretive because there we have any dreamt and maybe there were many dreams, but then we kind of like hyperlink into one in particular. And it says, Vahine, and this word, the Hine, like we oftentimes, they, it's translated in the King James Bible as behold, but it's, it's, it's not a behold. My, my Aramaic professor used to say the Hine was, here's a fact which I think is, is um, kind of an attentiveness in an academic term to pay attention. But the hine, you know, the hine is like, wake up. In this moment, here's what happened. Sulam. Sulam. To its top. And then it, tells us Magia Hashemaima, and it extended to the heavens. And so when Yaakov was really in this place of alignment, he, he enabled himself to become this connective portal of Shemayim Veha'aretz. And I think all of us, all of us in the temples of our bodies are of the potential to receive the Sulam or convert our bodies into a Sulam. A sulam stretching from the earth to the heavens. I think when people go to yoga classes, they're seeking to have this receptivity. And I think Torah in its urgency in this pasuk is begging us towards that connection. The hine, the pasuk continues. And here's another fact. Check this out. Malachi Elohim Olim the angels of God spread above and below the Sulam. This idea of something that we could see that is perhaps unseen revealed itself up and down. Now, I love to go on. I'm going to give a blessing that everyone else go on, but I can't continue or even close tonight without acknowledging something really elemental that's being asked of us. Again, I'm so guilty of not getting past two verses. Actually, two verses is a lot for me. I think the first night I did this, I didn't get past the letter bet. But the concept here is that there's a relationship happening. And the relationship for Yaakov 
we're told, you know, begins with himself, but it really isn't ending there. It's what happens with Yaakov in Vayetze is I present to you the concept that he discovered what encountering another is. And Martin Buber, beautiful, beautiful 20th century thinker, invites this concept and reimagines it through the words, I am thou. And that's the concept of encountering another, is that when I encounter something, I am no longer just myself. I become alive in the relationship. And in that relationship is the presence of something that we can call Hashem or God. You know, a beautiful God concept arises. And in that relational moment of the I and thou, we can engage into some sort of transcendent presence that would not be palpable or knowable were we only alone. And so I wanted to invite a little Martin Buber with us tonight because he, he says something quite exquisite and I wanna bring it here because it's really, it's really Jacoby. So Buber talks about freedom and he talks about um, how we can choose this freedom. And that's why I think the Torah portion begins with Vayetze, because he's going out, he's choosing freedom. He's not allowing himself to be a victim of his brother, a victim of that faith. He's choosing his own fate. And when we take personal agency is when we go on our soul journey. And so Buber writes, the man or person to whom freedom is guaranteed does not feel oppressed by causality. He knows that his mortal life is by its very nature an oscillation between I and thou. And that person senses the meaning of this. It suffices one that again and again, one may set foot on the threshold of the sanctuary in which one could never tarry. Indeed, having to leave it again and again is for that person an intimate part of the meaning and destiny of that person's life. There on the threshold, the response, the spirit is kindled in one again and again. Here in the unholy and indigent land, the spark has to prove itself. What is here called necessity cannot frighten it, for there he recognized true necessity, fate. And so it's when we discover this fate through freedom, right, that we begin to act. And freedom are fate encountered only by one that actualizes freedom. I love that. And so I think Bayetse is really urging us to find our freedom. Bayetse is urging us to go beyond, to go beyond the presence, to allow ourselves to turn off the lights. It encourages us to dwell in the dark. It says to us that from in this place of darkness, we are going to be able to draw more intimately into the truth of Hamakom to apprehend something greater than us that is with us all along. But we live so distracted in these mortal lives of social media and, and, and pain, pain, the way we pain one another. If we are one another with our lives and our vulnerabilities and our frailties, if only as we flee in our own lives, Vayetze, 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 going out, going out, going out, towards what? Towards what? Hamakom, Hamakom. The famous line of, of Yaakov, oh, God was in this place and I didn't know it. I paraphrase, right? But that he has that epiphany after this dream that he's more sensitized to his fate, I think is what we're urged to do. And the greatest way to get there, I argue, is to go dancing in the dark. Go dancing in the dark.
start a fire without a spark. This comes for fire. Even if we're just dancing in the dark. See you next week.